1982. Tremendous miracles happened. Military miracles and political miracles. We went through a number of the political miracles last week. Reagan going on vacation, the prime minister leaving the country, the secretary of state changing, the Senate suddenly embracing Israel. All of these things just to create the milieu, the environment. that Israel could have gone in, taken over the country completely, taken over Beirut and just destroyed the PLO and created security for their northern flank, for their northern border, which really was security for the entire Israel. But they didn't do it. Even though God made all these military miracles, even though God made all these political miracles, and still they didn't do it. And the Rebbe said, why? Because people's political concerns overcame security issues. What are their political concerns? Fear of the world, fear of the nations, fear of pressures. Everything we're saying, I mean, going over all those political miracles with, with Reagan, with the prime minister, with the Senate, with the secretary of state, showed there was no pressure. And at that time also in 82, and probably also today, there was a lot of Arab infighting. So they weren't even so able to focus on Israel. They all had their own problems, but they're so scared. The Rebbe said, they're so scared of what will the world say? Because they're so scared of what will the world say, they're doing far more than the world would ask them to do, would demand from them to do. Why are people so scared of the people around them, of the nations of the world, of the Goyim? Because of the, so to speak, guy inside ourselves, the animal soul inside ourselves. Whereas this is such an exile, the Rebbe said, we're so scared of our own inner animal. And the more important a person is, the more deeply does he has this personal exile almost bound up by his own inner evil. And I thought this had a lot of personal application because when we're intimidated by our evil. I mean, that's basically what they're saying. They were intimidated by their own issues inside of themselves. When we're intimidated by what's going on inside of ourselves, then automatically, as the Rebbe is saying, you're intimidated by the world around you. These politicians were intimidated from their own inner evil, so they were intimidated by the world around them. I'm, I'm sure you saw this was going around. It was probably posted on our group as well, this one uh, member of the Knesset that I remember she spoke before when the first hostage, the, the soldier was rescued, the girl soldier, the woman soldier, and, and how she spoke then so strongly. And now again, the same Knesset woman is speaking so so strongly and you can see she's overcoming her own inner evil so she's not intimidated by anything and she's gonna say it straight 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 have you seen this in your life that when you overcome what's going on inside of you the world doesn't phase you too much either we're not intimidated from the inside we're not intimidated from the outside we're not politicians that have a lot of ability to make decisions that are going to affect world jewelry you affect the jewish people when you affect the land of israel you're affecting world jewelry so maybe it's not as obvious but i do think think maybe in more subtle ways, we do have these situations as well. Aliza, what were you going to add? I, I was just raising my hand that yes, I could think of times where nothing mattered in terms of any external concern or or any other concern. It was just doing what needed to be done. And that's, that's the space we want to be in, that you just do what you have to do and you don't let anything else take precedence. And unfortunately, the Bob Shreve is saying Israel has a tradition, a history in modern state of Israel that again and again and again, they put politics or politicians put their political careers to be very frank and blunt about what the Rebbe is saying here. The Rebbe doesn't say it as bluntly, but, but pretty strong. But this is bottom line what the Rebbe is saying. Politicians put their political fears and political careers before the army's opinion on security matters. The Rebbe says this has this happened to every situation. Camp David Accords in 78, the Yom Kippur War in 73, the Six Day War in 67, the Sinai War in 56. In every situation, the end of the day, the politicians did not follow the army. Even though the army strategic leaders, the generals, the commanders clearly said, if you do this, it will lead to more casualties. And each time they did it, and each time, unfortunately, those casualties happen. By the Yom Kippur War, it's actually interesting, it's unusual, let me put it like that, that the Prime Minister at that time, Golda Meir, actually admitted, very unusual for a politician to admit a mistake. Notice, politicians in Israel have yet to admit mistakes they made that perhaps led to October 7th. I, maybe they will, we could, we could give them time, of course, what they're saying is we can't deal with it. Now we have to fight this war, which, which okay, we'll, we'll accept that political ploy, but nobody's going to forget. And it'd be very interesting if politicians actually say, we erred, we were wrong. 
we made a mistake. But by the Yom Kippur War, Golda Meir did because before the Yom Kippur War, however Israel was acting, they knew what was going on. They knew the Arab world was starting to gang up against them. They knew a war was imminent. And the army said, draft the soldiers. Have all the soldiers drafted in advance. Have all the soldiers ready in advance. We don't have to necessarily preemptively strike. But let's be completely ready so the second they cross the border, we can get to them. And Golda Meir refused. She said, no, we're not going to do that. We won't look good. The world isn't going to look at us good. Not that the world ever looks at us good. But no, no, no. We can only do something if we're attacked. And they waited. And they did not do anything. And Lubavitcher Rebbe, that whole summer before Yom Kippur, that summer was screaming and screaming about this issue, about how we have to do whatever we can and, and the enemy is coming. It's so strong. They ignored it all. They ignored everything the Rebbe was saying. They ignored everything the army was saying. And Yom Kippur came and there were hundreds and hundreds of casualties because we have to think about what the world thinks of us, which is ridiculous when you're putting that against saving Jewish lives. And in any case, ridiculous, because no matter what we do, the world's going to look at us with a bad eye, probably. So wh wh why worry over it? But she actually, very unusually, after the war, she publicly admitted, confessed that they were wrong. We can't behave this way. It's, we can't do this. We can't put Jewish lives on the line of, of politics. So the Rebbe said, you would think after that happened, I mean, this is 82, that was 73. It's not so many years later. You would think that it wouldn't happen again, but it did happen again because that was 73. Talking about five years later was the Camp David Accords. I'm sure most of us remember the Camp David Accords. That was in 78. And what happened by the Camp David Accords? We took large vital stretches of land that were important to the security of Israel that would provide a buffer zone between us and the enemy of Egypt. And yes, it is the enemy of Egypt, no matter what people pretend. And, you know, this is, we just gave it away. Now in 82, they were saying now in 82, because that's when they were fighting Shalom HaGalil, the war in Lebanon. What was the Israeli army government saying? We need a buffer zone. We need space between us and the enemy. We need enough of buffer that if the enemy is going to try to bomb us, we'll have enough warning and we won't get hurt. Well, that buffer zone, which is the reason in 82, why Israel claimed the need to attack Lebanon, that's what they just voluntarily gave away by Camp David in 78, five years earlier. Again, the more you think about it, it's like almost painful. It's painful to talk about it. It was painful for me to learn this. It was painful for me to review it. It was painful for me to think about these ideas. What else did they give away in Camp David? The oil wells. That's like the most significant warfare equipment we have is oil wells. They gave them away. You need them for war. You need them for peacetime industry. You need oil. They just gave them away. And the, the ridiculousness of the situation is that Israel didn't own the oil wells. They weren't owned by Israelis. They were owned by foreigners. So Israel, who had no legal rights on the oil wells, gave them voluntarily to Egypt. And Israel afterwards had to pay hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to the legal owners of those oil wells. And now the Rebbe is saying, according to what Israel is agreeing to admit to, what Israel is confessing, besides all the money they had to spend on the rights of those oil wells that they gave away without permission, so to speak, Camp David cost Israel $17 billion. And they're not done. $17 billion. And much more important than money, our soldiers, our sons, our brothers, our fathers, spilled their blood for that land. Why did they spill their blood for that land? Because they trusted it would guarantee the security of the Jewish people. So when you take that land that people died for and you just give it away, you're taking all those carbonos, all those Jews that died, and you're making their death meaningless. And the main point, it was so unnecessary. And this is, again, the point that the Rebbe is making here, which is applicable in all wars and applicable, of course, now in Gaza very, very strongly. If Israel had so, stood strong and refused to give away the land and refused to give away the oil wells, Egypt would have signed the Camp David Accords anyway. How do we see this? Well, the Rebbe says very strongly. Israel also had other demands from Egypt. Very strongly, Egypt demanded the old city of Jerusalem which we won in 67. They said, that's contingent. We will not agree to these Camp David Accords unless you give up the old city of Jerusalem. And Israel said, okay, 
עד כאן. Too much. No way. We are not giving away Jerusalem. And when Israel stood firm, Egypt backed down. And the Rebbe says the same thing would have occurred with every one of their demands. If they hadn't given in the oil wells, they would have backed down. If they hadn't given the land, if they'd given some token small thing so everyone could save face, Egypt would have backed down. How do we know? Because you look at the political situation in Egypt. Egypt at that time in 78 was in complete inner turmoil. There was no money. There was no law and order. The president was terrified that he was going to be overthrown, as keeps happening in these Arab countries until today. So when Anwar Sadat had a need to show the world, and especially to show the Egyptians, I'm the powerful one. I'm the one that created peace with Israel. I'm the leader of the Arab world. That's what he wanted. The land, yes, no. The oil wells, yes, no. Nice, frills. At the end of the day, he was doing it like politicians often do things to save his own skin. And to save his own skin, he would have signed those peace treaty no matter what he got. And the represent the same thing was going on in America. Who was the president of America then? Carter. Carter, if you remember, if you're into American politics, was a crazy fluke victory Georgia plantation owner. There was no president from the deep south since before the Civil War. Like, you know, no. Well, I was just going to say that. Yeah. I was going to say, Carter had a big deal in this, too. He was not good. Like, it was bad. Absolutely. Carter was pushing this the same way Sadat was pushing this, unfortunately. And, and Begin went along, which is so bizarre if anyone knows the history of Begin, which just goes to show that when you're in that seat, we, can, we can't fathom the pressures people are under because, like, My son once pointed this out to me. My son, who, who's engaged now, the one I was telling you about, Yosef Yitzhak, he's very into Israeli politics. Like, he knows it. Oh, my gosh. And he pointed out that every time Israel majorly gave away land or made a major concession to the Arabs, it was always when a righty prime minister was in power. It was never when a lefty was in power. It was always when a righty was in power, which is so bizarre. But just exactly highlights the Rebbe's point. When you're under that political, gl you know, glittering, glimmering lights, it just messes up your mind and you do things that make no sense. No sense to your personal values. No sense to logic, reason, what you stand for, what's good for the Jewish people that you're leading. So Anwar Sadat had his whole package of issues, which is why he... desperately needed those Camp David Accords. And Carter had his, because Carter knew, I mean, it was a complete, as we call it, fluke that he was elected. Nobody predicted that at all. It seemed like such a dark horse, so ridiculous. And now he was coming up for re-elections. And he thought, if I can be the one who bartered the peace, who created the peace, who pushed and made the peace, between Israel and Egypt, wow, I'll for sure win. So actually, unfortunately, the Camp David Accords happened, and the next year Carter lost to Reagan anyway. But, but this is the rubbish, it's all politics. Unfortunately, when a person is at that level, most of the time, and we see the president of, our, of Argentina is seemingly oblivious to that, but for most people in those positions, You just want to keep your power and add to your power and maintain your power. And that's what motivates your decisions. And unfortunately, not the lives of the people in your country. So basically, but the Rebbe's point is, all the players here, both Egypt and America, have personal motives to make it happen. So if Israel was firm, they could have had the Camp David Accords. They could have signed them. without these horrific costs, these horrific financial costs, these horrific security costs. And it's just, it's just unbelievable, as I'm saying, that this most hawkish prime minister of all the prime ministers of Israel was a prime minister when this happened, which, again, I think just highlights the point the Rebbe is making, that there is so much pressure, there's so much sense of your own political skin when you're in those seats. And I think, of course, also here, 
I think there's that personal application to ourselves as well. If we could ask ourselves, are there times when we don't do the right thing, the moral thing, what our seeming perspective on life would dictate, and instead we do things to promote ourselves for our own personal benefits, even though it's not what we view as correct. Now, you could say, no, that never happened to me. And it's possible it didn't, because as I'm saying, the higher you are in these situations, the more that happens and the more pressures you have. We, you know, we're small people. So maybe we never have these pressures to bend our moral, ethical values and perspectives for our own self, to promote ourselves, to save ourselves, to help ourselves. That if you do, then you're in exactly the same position as all these politicians in Israel. Aliza, I was assuming the whole time your hand was up from before. Is it from before or is it something new? No, actually, I have a question. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry because I kept seeing your hand. I'm like, no. Okay. I'm just, okay, sorry. So I understand the the concept of the external pressure or the internal pressure. But what I don't understand is looking at the example of Golda Meir. So she made a choice. It was a very calculated decision on the part of her and the government that was in power at the time. Well, you know, everybody in labor and, and, and she later said it was a mistake. Most of the politicians, they're going to be voted out of office because people are upset that so many people were killed. So they can't both look at the external, what does the world want, and also stay in power in terms of holding on to their power. So that's where my question is, if they're power hungry to have a Knesset seat or be prime minister, then how can they afford to look at the world if they're looking for their own political power? I hear you. And I think it's a great question. I was actually myself, I don't know if I'm sure we all hear the same thing. So I know like right after October 7th, there was a lot of yeah, unofficial. I don't think anyone ever said anything like, I, I didn't see it flying on WhatsApp, so to speak. It wasn't as official as that, but sort of people were like whispering, like, did the government know what was going on? Did the government know? Like, in other words, how could they not have known? How was it possible that this happened and the Israeli government didn't realize? Like, impossible. Our security, our intelligence? But then then the question would be, but if they do know, why in the world would they let it happen? I mean, it's one of these, like, whatever. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything. I, I have no knowledge, and I'm not, God forbid, saying they knew it was going to happen and they let it happen. That's not my point. My point is that when you start speculating, it's like, you know, again, then you go into this like political spin of like, if we know what's going on and we start aggressively trying to smash down Hamas first, what's the world gonna say? If this is gonna happen, what's it gonna be? But then we're the, you know, like you can make a hundred million calculations where you convince yourself that you're gonna come out ahead even when, as you're saying, just simple logic means no way. So simple logic is saying, Golda Meir, why would the country want you when because of you so many lives were lost? But when she's in her spin of, we can't be the aggressors, we can't make a preemptive strike, we can't call a draft, because then the world, then the world, then the world, and the meanwhile, she's traveling all over the world to garner support, like, she's viewing herself as, I'm, I'm the hero that's saving Israel, not, I'm the one that's destroying Israel. So I think, like, hindsight is twenty twenty, and when you're standing on the side, you almost have twenty twenty also. Just like so many times, if, if someone comes to any one of us, I'm sure we've all had this experience, someone comes to you with some problem, some issue they're going through, and you listen to it, and it's so clear to you, and you give them such simple advice, and they're like, wow, how did you think of that? Well, it's very easy. I'm not in your shoes. You know, <laughs> When you're outside the situation, the picture looks very different. So I think somehow these politicians, even though as you're saying, what you're saying makes perfect sense, 
But somehow when you're in those seats of power, you just don't, you, you like, you keep thinking you're going to play everyone. You're going to fool everyone. You're cooler and smarter and faster than everyone, you know? So you're going to do this for this, but you're going to take care of this for this, and you're going to do this for this, and you're going to do this for this. I'm like, and you like somehow think you're going to keep all the balls in the air. Now you're right. That doesn't happen. The balls crash and people see through you. But like somehow you convince yourself that's not going to happen. I mean, I wouldn't even want to share the backstory of Gush Katif because it's so horrifically painful. But if you know it and it's like, who did he think he was fooling? What was going on? But when you're in those seats of power, you somehow have this illusion that you're going to fool everyone, that you're smarter, that you're better at the game, that you're going to fool everyone. And you do manage to fool a lot of people. So that keeps convincing you that you're going to do that. Unfortunately, I wish I had a different answer for you, but that is unfortunately what I think is the answer. So here we have the American president. Sorry. Before you move on then, then coming to a more practical level for us as individuals, what, what do we do so that just as you gave the example of when someone comes to us wanting advice about a situation and we're able to better, more clearly see it because it's not our situation. How do we avoid fooling ourselves with any situation? Well, that's actually what you just said. It's actually one of the techniques that our sages recommend. That very often, if we're in a situation that's confusing, the best thing is to consult with someone else and specifically, a person should have the Rav, the rabbinical authority that they consult with, to have, as we call it, Da'as Torah, to understand Torah's perspective, because Torah's perspective is on all of life, not just how you keep showers and how you keep kosher. Torah's perspective, you know, embraces all of life. And also, K'nele Chaver, we can have various levels of this Rav Chaver, Traditionally, the term we use is a mashpia, right? So what's a mashpia? A mashpia is a spiritual mentor, not your rabbi. It'd be miles above you. It doesn't have to be, you know, someone that has limitless knowledge of Torah, but someone that you look up to, someone that is, you feel closer to Hashem, to God than you are, and who does have the gift of perspective, the gift of not being within the situation, but also the gift of caring about you. So when you're talking about the rabbi, it's very nice if you have a personal relationship with the rabbi. But if you don't, you can still have somebody who's your rabbi and you can still trust his understanding of Taira. But for a mashpia, for a personal mentor, for a counselor, for an advisor, you're looking for someone that knows you and cares about you. And at the same time is higher in their, where they're holding in their relationship with God than you are. So they have enough of a height to be able to give you perspective and enough of a closeness that you know what they're saying really comes from a lot of care and concern for you personally. Because like if a rabbi tells you something, if you go to a big rabbi and they give you, tell you something, you just sort of have to nullify yourself and listen. And you might feel like, no way, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. No, this must be the wrong answer. Well, this is what Torah says. So you just have to sort of nullify yourself. But when you speak to a counselor, a mashpia figure, you're feeling, she knows me. She cares about me. She understands me. And if she's saying this, this is really what's best for me. So you could take the same idea, but you can integrate it because it's coming from a voice that's not only higher than you, but it's also close to you and you know cares about you. So I think a lot of times when you're, in this position and you're not sure, yes, no, am I doing this for myself? I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. Am I, you know, like sometimes things are very ambiguous, very unclear, just lots of grays. What's the right thing here? That's when it's really, really, I think the, the way of Tyra to consult with the Mashbia, with the Rav, and hopefully there's a Hashkacha practice as well, that since you're walking God's road, they should have the correct insight to, to help give you clarity to your situation. 
So if the Prime Minister of Israel had a, a spiritual mentor that he was talking to, things might have looked very, very, very different. And not drenched in ego and power, but rather in concern for the land of Israel, and even more important, concern for the people of Israel. So again, we're saying the president of Egypt desperately needed to sign, the president of America desperately wanted that handshake on the White House lawn. It could have happened, the priest treaty could have happened, and we still could have had that protective buffer and kept our oil wells. It's really interesting because you just see how warped things are. People in 82 were saying, what are you talking about? It's so good we have the Camp David Accords. What do we care that we gave away all that desert land and all those oil wells and the cost of $17 billion, whatever. We would otherwise be fighting on two fronts, Egypt and the North, Lebanon and Syria in Lebanon. Now we're only fighting the North. We only are fighting on one front. That's very good. Of course, we know what's going on now in Israel where we're so succeeding with Hamas that Hezbollah is like, almost in a reaction coming out so strongly now. So who, who wants a two front war? But the Rebbe says, no, it's actually the opposite. If we had been firm, and there's a very important point, in general, in all of the dealings of Israel with the Arabs and in our understanding of these dealings, if we are firm, the North wouldn't have started up. The way to prevent war the way to save Jewish lives is being strong enough that the other side is scared to start up. And when Israel gave away those valuable oil wells, gave away all that land, all that security land, the terrorists, the Arabs see you're scared. And because they see we're scared, they have the confidence to attack. And unfortunately, we know that Egypt told the terrorists then they were telling the PLO confidential information that they knew from Israel because of the Camp David Accords. And the terrorists, of course, used that confidential information against us. So this is very much, very much resonating what's going on now. And the sense of the more fearless we are, the more courageous we are against not just the Arabs, not just the terrorists, against the opinion of the world, against whatever the world says, we don't care. It doesn't make a difference. We care about the land of Israel. We care even more about the people of Israel. That's our priority. Everything else is irrelevant. The more we not only say that, but do the actions that express that, the more the other side crumbles. When we're strong, they're very, very, very weak. And this is, this is just a general, general perspective. And if you remember, this was so strong. We saw this so clearly now after October 7th. If you remember the Friday afterwards, Hamas proclaimed that Friday as like a holy day, holy day for Arabs all over the world to attack Jews. And my son from Israel was still with us and it was, it was right after Sukkot, it was a Friday after. And he has a very good friend who's in charge of the security in, in a certain, a few settlements by the West Bank where the Arabs are always attacking them. And now they're supposed to. <laughs> so my son, I remember he was in my house, he was speaking to his friend and he said, are, are you ready? I mean, you always get attacked and now they're officially supposed to attack you. This is supposed to happen tomorrow. Are you ready? And his friend said, technically, no way. We are not ready. If they actually attack us, we are not ready. But he said, since Israel has shown so much strength since October 7th, this is literally fresh, fresh, fresh. This is Friday after. Has shown so much strength, he doesn't think those Arabs who always start up would dare do anything, even when they're getting this command from Hamas to attack. And that's exactly what happened. I remember my son was flying that Friday and people were saying to fly and he's very obviously Jewish and traveling in New York, the, the public transportation systems, what's going to happen? Is it safe? Is it safe? We have to be fearless, confident, courageous. And then, and then the other people are scared. They're scared. And that was what the Rebbe was saying throughout the intifadas. If you show strength, they back down. 
if you act in this conciliatory fashion, you think you're being nice, they know you're being weak and they fight harder. And I think that's also something that we could really have a personal application for. I think it, in terms in general of ourselves as Jewish people to be strong, proud, confident Jewish people. And the more we are, the more the world respects us. And the world looks at us as like, wow, this is so cool. This is so special. And when we are intimidated and feel weak and feel weak, not strong, not confident in who we are and what it means to be a Jew, then the world looks at us differently. And when we're strong and proud and confident, the world respects it. I, I've seen this personally so many times, and I'm sure everyone here has, that when we're strong and proud and out there as religious Jewish women, the world respects. And when we're like apologetic, the world doesn't look at it as, wow. Why are we doing this? Like here, okay, in 82, the Rebbe is focusing on all the mistakes in 77, and 78 actually, sorry, 78, five years before. And here we are in 2024 and we're focusing on them. The Rebbe says, why are we focusing on the bad of Jews? Why are we focusing on the mistakes they made? Why are we focusing on things so painful? to not make those mistakes again, to listen to the army, not politicians. So why are we in 2024 focusing on the stock of the Rebbe in 82, focusing on the Camp David Accords of 78? For the exact same reason. We're politicians. We have the ear of Netanyahu. We're Jewish women. And our very conviction, our very belief, our voice, that has a power to give wisdom and courage and backbone to the Jewish people that actually do make these decisions. All the Jewish people are one body. We're all one organism and we all make a difference. And when we really with absolute conviction know this energy, where it has to go in terms of the strength, the strength of the Jewish people, the strength of the land of Israel, the prioritization of Jewish lives, of never again, of protecting the land. As we're believing it, thinking it, saying it, talking to others about it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And we see like what happened in Lebanon? Well, they didn't finish off the job because even though the prime minister of Israel was away and the president of America was on vacation for 10 days, they still didn't finish off the job. They were still scared of their own shadows. And those politicians prevented Israel from completing the war, despite the army's warning that if you don't, there's going to be more casualties, more people dying, more people getting wounded, wounded. And nothing shifted. The politicians just continued exactly what they were doing. And this is, this is exactly the situation that we have to make sure. How do we make sure? by our belief, by our conviction. We have to follow Torah. We have to prioritize Jewish lives. And we don't give in because fear of the enemy within ourselves, the enemies outside, and the pressures from friends and enemies outside. Israel, you keep making the same mistake. You keep listening to people driven by fear. Like here, you, people are so scared. What's going to happen if we attack Beirut? And then for sure, Russia will get involved. And then for sure, America will not be our friend. And then for sure, and then for sure. You could, you could ask these people, the Rebbe says, I don't get it. You keep making the same mistake. It keeps coming back and biting you. You keep getting hurt by these mistakes. And then you keep making the mistakes again. Which I think, of course, is a very relevant point that we could sometimes ask ourselves. You know, sometimes we keep making the same mistakes, meaning it doesn't work. And then we do it again. You know, we, it doesn't work, but we still cling to this outmoded behavior. That's not working. It's not working and we still keep doing it. And that's something that's, you know, to really think about this in terms of ourselves. 
Wait, Aliza, do you have a question again? I, I, I'm always confused if you have something new or if it's the past. I do. I do. Okay, good. Okay, sure. Go for it. Thank you. So thinking about, I don't know, but what occurred to me, as you said, why are we going back to talking about Lebanon from 82 or from Camp David from 78? So really, it's our whole history because the the Moroccan themselves, when they went in, the Nassim, who were our leaders, wanted to hold on to a situation and their power. So that was not new. Shaul, when it comes to Amalek, that's nothing new in terms of misguidedness and, and then not finishing the job. And so it's not like we've ever in our entire history finished the job. So if we haven't yet finished the job, the question is, so we don't have that model to follow. We only know what not to do. So how do we know what to do in terms of like, I'm just thinking like, okay, the leaders, they, they've all consulted when, when he was alive in the physical sense with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but none of them are following his advice. And, and I only wish that someone would run following his advice, but where, I, I guess, how do we get to finishing the job that David Amelech, Yoshua, that we don't have in our history? I think the point the Rebbe is making here is that if you would just listen to the army, you would be okay. Because when you're not finishing the job, it's because you're looking at yourself and not what the army's telling you. That's the point the Rebbe is making. It's not like, you know, it's interesting, like I keep uh, praying that the Israeli government, every single day I think about the Israeli government, <laughs> very obsessed, the Israeli government should have the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it. And what the Rebbe is saying is the wisdom to know what to do is what the army is telling you. The Rebbe is saying the army knows what to do. They really do. Now, obviously, they must have a lot of, as we call it, siyata deshmaya, you know, God helping them, because I'm sure it's not so clear and simple all the time. But that is, you know, and it's very interesting because you talked about many of the Israeli political leaders and military leaders consulting with Lubav Tereb, and there are many, 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 many times, of course, that they did so all the time, both coming to literally flying to New York because they had very important questions they had to discuss with the Rebbe. And of course, you know, asking through the Secretary of Yemen Klein and, you know, various ways. And the Rebbe could be quite tough on the army, you know, and could go through machinery by machinery. Why do you have this one? And why do you have this one? And why do you have this one? And why do you have this one? Why do you have this one? Why do you have this one? And the Rebbe spoke to many generals after wars and pointed out all the mistakes they made. <laughs> You know, you should have done like this, you should have done like this, you could have done like this, you could have done like this. And it's like, it's like, you know, there's so many people in the army, in the Air Force, in the Navy that speak of their private audiences. And, and very often the Rebbe was showing what they did that was not the best. Yet still the Rebbe is assuming there's a certain, there's a certain protection God is giving the army of Israel, I mean, Sahel in general, I mean, the entire arm, armed force. And they're going to know what to do if we listen to them. So you are right. And what you're talking about, these past historical examples is quite eerie. You are absolutely right. Nothing is new, right? That's what Shlomo Mel said a long time ago. Nothing is new under the sun. You are absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right. And yet the Rebbe is saying, if you listen to the army, you'd be okay. Which doesn't take away, as I'm saying, all the Rebbe's critique of the army. But still, overall, you would be okay. God will put the right ideas in their heads. You would be okay. And that's, in essence, what they have to do. And you're right. We've never done it yet, but we have to do it. And it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, in the current situation, and you'd think that political people would actually want to prioritize saving Jewish lives for their own political skins. Hopefully there is that sense now. You know, maybe you did some mistakes and maybe that led to October 7th. And how in the world can you redeem yourself in the public opinion? only by really, really, really making this war a massive success. No mowing the lawns. Really, really making this war a massive, massive, massive success.
So when when you're saying that the the Rebbe said that the army would know what to do, is that the same way that when people consulted the Rebbe regarding different health issues, that yes, on the one hand, he he always said you must go to good doctors, and he even there were times where he said don't listen to this one or get a second opinion, and 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 some of what he said is just beyond it's just so amazing but he also said the body has its own intelligence and so is where you said not so many minutes earlier we're all one body we're all one being so what we do can strengthen other people was the rebbe then saying that the army knows what to do the same way that the physical body has its own intelligence and healing? I wasn't looking at it that way. I don't know. But the Rebbe definitely, not only in this talk, in many other talks, keeps going back to the army. Again, as the Rebbe actually says, you know, I didn't have time to go into all the points, but the Rebbe said, the army has to watch out. Don't think, you know, as the verse says, don't think it's your power. When you think it's your power, you're chasing away the success recognize is God's power, recognize you are God's tool, and that applied then, and that applies now, and that applies in countless situations with Tzahal, with the army in Israel. But we need to use nature, and God works through nature. I would look at it like Hashkacha Pratis. You know, when we have Bitacha, when we have trust, trust is not only that in the end of the day, it will be good. I mean, we do trust that in the end of the day, it will be good. But trust is also in the blow by blow because everything is Hashkacha Pratis, which means God is running the show detail by detail. And therefore, if the army in general is giving you an advice, the strategic advice to how best destroy the enemy, how best protect the land of Israel, overall, trust the Hashkacha Pratis. This is the best way to go. Now, again, as I'm saying, the Rebbe points out countless times the mistakes the army has made. That's true. But overall, they're going to guide you in generally the right direction. Though they're human and maybe God's going to allow them to mess up in some of the some of the details. But overall, God's going to use them to protect the Jewish people. They're going to be, and they are, far better than they should be because they're protecting the Jewish people. That's why every one of them, any one, any soldier who dies, that's a kadosh. That, that's a martyr for God. You never even lived a life for God. You died for God. You died for God. You weren't thinking about God. If you died for the Jewish people, if you died for the land of Israel, you died for God. So similarly, the army will have the siyata deshmaya, they will have the divine aid that in the end, they're going to guide you in the right path. So we will stop at this point. Next week, we're starting with Purim. And can't wait to see. I mean, this week had a lot of excitement and some amazing things that truly came out from the successes that God gave us, unbelievable successes, crazy successes that make absolutely no sense. And the more you hear about it and read about it, it just more you understand how it makes no sense. Clearly just one thing, the hand of God. And we should continue to see that in Israel, in Eretz Yisrael, and in the entire world. Thank you so much.